it was like um, very mixed feelings when I actually received the paper and saying that my asylum application had been approved because it felt like a part of me was completely gone. Like my Jordanian part was gone. I think part of, I mean, big part of why I do this work is it's not selfless. It's it's selfish in a way because it heals me to work with others who have gone through what I've gone through on some level. You're listening to season two of Seeking Refuge, a podcast about the human story behind refugees. Your host for this week is Tyler Jackson. This is Tyler. In this interview, I talk with Luma Mufle, a former asylum seeker from Jordan. Luma founded Fuji's Academy and Fuji's Family, an all-refugee school and soccer team in Clarkson, Georgia. In the interview, Luma and I discuss her past and how it has informed her thinking and the work she does with refugee children today, among other things. She also has a wonderful TED Talk that you should check out after listening to the interview, which we will link in the description. Now, here's the interview. Just sort of a uh, general question. Could you tell us about Fuji's family? Um, when it, when was it established? What is it exactly? Um, uh, Fuji's family was established officially as a 501c3 in 2006, but it started off in 2004 as a soccer team in Clarkson, Georgia, um, and then grew to an after-school program and then to summer programming and eventually to uh, year-round school um we run the only network for refugee kids in the country and that would be fuji's academy correct yes that's correct so could you tell me what are the goals of fuji's academy the goals (laughs) um i I think this is uh it's like a a backward design of an organization you know it's like coming in and, and meeting the students and realizing what their needs were. Um, you know, uh, ultimately our goal is to have our students feel welcome in, in the United States, uh, have them feel uh, that they can integrate successfully in, into this new country, into their new home, um, and to empower them with all the skills and tools they need to do that. And so that's like different ways we do that. Um, you know, uh, it's really important for us that our students understand their identity and uh, what they can contribute. Um, so understanding their home identity, figuring out their new American identity and how to bring those two together. The sense of belonging and feeling at home, we do that through sport, uh, specifically through soccer. Uh, all the students in our schools play on a soccer team. They play on teams that are ethnically mixed. Uh, some kids play on teams with other uh, players from warring factions. Um, but it's a place where they feel at home. Um, it's a sport that uh, has positive connotations for them, regardless of where they've been. And, and it's a great workout. So I've seen your TED talk as well as several interviews talking about the uh, the importance of soccer and that it plays to, like you said, creating that sense of identity, that sense of belonging, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and navigating that. Well, it's, and it's also you have like a, immediately you have a group of friends. So if you've just moved to the country and you don't know anyone, you don't know the language. One of the easiest ways to to get friends and and feel like you belong somewhere is to be part of a team. And, and our students feel that right away. They're with 14 other uh, kids close to their age that have similar experiences of, uh, you know, having moved to this country, not knowing the language, uh, you know, some having names that others have a hard time pronouncing. Mm-hmm. But then on that soccer field, you, you're all one, you know, and you're all the same. And it's, it's got, it's not magical powers, but it's, it's got, it brings together our students in ways nothing else could. 
Could you tell us about how the education at the school is specialized for refugee children? So uh, let's say we have a, a student that just arrived into the United States from the Congo, um, and he's 12 years old. Um, he would be placed, if he was to go the traditional route, into sixth or seventh grade. Um, he might get one or two hours of English uh, as a second language support, and then all his other classes are mainstreamed. Um, when he gets English language support, he would get art, music, or PE, um, and then expected to perform regular math classes, regular English classes when he does not know the letters of the alphabet or doesn't know how to add or multiply. And so when our students come, I would say 80, 85 percent of our incoming sixth grade classes are testing at the pre-K level. And so that's where we meet them. Our sixth grade classes look and feel like kindergarten classes. Um, we pack three years into one year. Our students are very eager to learn. And in their first year with us, the only classes we have are English, math, music, art, yoga, and soccer. Um, there's n no other content area. And uh, part of the focus on the arts is those are other languages of expression. So if you are having a, if you can't read and you're having a hard time uh, expressing yourself, visual arts are a very easy way to do it. Music is very therapeutic and teaches enunciation and confidence. And we see incredible growth during that year. So uh, in one year, they do two to three years of academic gain. Seventh grade is like a three to five. And by their third year, the bulk of our students are on grade level. Our classes are 14 kids in the classroom, the size of a soccer team, and... Um, so it's kind of like a turbocharged approach to education. Yeah, uh, you talked about the language barrier that exists uh, for children when they first when they first arrive. Uh, mm -hmm. Other than the language barrier, what is the toughest challenge that students face? I, mean, I think figuring it all out. You know, like we have some students that have come from some remote villages that have never used uh, a stove or an oven. We have some students whose families don't understand credit cards, and every one of our students has never experienced Halloween, <laughs> you know? And so it's like these small things that we take for granted. Um, I mean, like one of my first years, uh, I, I was dropping off uh, one of my players to his apartment, and the fire department was out there, and the parents are out there, and everybody's yelling at each other, and... Um, the family had uh, set a fire in their apartment. They were they were trying to cook, and that's the way they had cooked back home. And the organization that resettled them, you know, put them in the apartment, did not explain what a stove was, how mm -hmm. to cook using it. Um, and so they did what they knew, and the fire department, like, lost it. They're like, you're going to burn the entire complex down. Um, and I was like, you know, like, just give me some time with them. We're going to teach them this. They don't know. And the, you know, the um, firefighter thought I was making it up. He's like, how do they not know? And I'm like, they don't know. Like, why can't we just teach people? Like, why are we assuming everyone knows what, what that is? We take it for granted. Um, take it for granted. Like, I think um, those of us that have lived here for so long, I think we forget how the majority of the world lives and how they don't have what we have. And we do take it for granted. Um, and my students like constantly remind me of that. So I wanted to talk about some things that you said in your TED talk, which uh, was excellent, by the way. You talk, you tell the story of your, your grandmother taking you to a refugee camp uh, to play with the children there. Mm -hmm. um, and after playing them, uh, she told you about the refugees. Don't feel sorry for them. Believe in them. Yeah. And I was wondering how... Could you explain how this message speaks to how we should treat refugees or how refugees should be treated in general and what what sort of attitudes we should hold towards them? So, like, if you look at, at the refugee experience, um, you look at someone who has fled their country because of war. They may have seen horrible atrocities and they come and they start and build a new life in a new country. And for the most part, they are successful. And those are character traits that every coach, every educator, every CEO wants in their people. It's uh, strength, it's resilience, it's never giving up, it's determination. Um, and instead of looking at those character traits, we look at that experience 
and are horrified. And we should be horrified at anyone having to go through that, especially children. But we don't believe in their capabilities. Um, I have seen educators, I've seen employers treat them with complete disrespect, um, not believing they are capable of accomplishing anything. I had another principal when I opened the Fuji's Academy told me I was wasting my time, that these students would never accomplish anything. Wow. And, and that was common, like that I was crazy to even think about investing in this population. And, and what I see is like traits that I want to build in my own children and optimism, like to go through that and still believe that the world is good and you have hope. I, I don't want people to go through the refugee experience, but it is an extremely powerful experience. And the kind of people it builds are, are those you want on your team. So you talk about in your journey to the, U- the United States, uh, you come here and mm-hmm. people would attempt to help you by offering to pay your rent, pay for a meal, uh, pay yep. for a new suit. Um, and yep. you said that this made you feel isolated and incapable. Uh, yep. And later on, you, you meet a woman uh, named Miss Sarah and she offers you mm-hmm. a job at her diner yep. to work washing dishes and, 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 and cleaning toilets. And you said uh-huh. that this experience made you feel valued and embraced in contrast uh, to the previous experience of people offering you what you might call charity. Um, yes. So I would ask why, why was there this difference in the way you felt and what does this say about how people should go about offering to, I don't know if help is the right word, but um, yeah. maybe provide opportunities um, for refugees to succeed. I don't know if, if you've read like the books, uh, Toxic Charity or When Helping Hurts. Um, but those really like pinpoint, you know, some of the issues we have when we want to help others. Um, a lot of the time it's about like a quick solution. Like here, here's a suit for a job interview instead of giving me work so I could earn that money. So I could go buy that suit instead of like paying my rent, just nudging me out of bed. So I, I, you know, and supporting me in finding employment. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think, I think a lot of organizations, a lot of people don't think through what the person on the other end is receiving and how they're feeling. They think about how they feel like, oh, guess what? I, you know, this person's struggling and I gave them all my used clothes, including used underwear, which we've had, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it just drives me crazy. It's like, why would you do that? Mm-hmm. Like what, what other approaches can you have in empowering a community to be self-reliant? Um, because long-term that's what you want. And the approaches that we have right now will always have that dynamic of, Oh, please give me, give me, give me. Um, Mm -hmm. instead of, you know what, I've, I've, you've given me the skill sets and the tools that I don't need you anymore. You know, and that's a conversation we have with all our teams, like our, our, our faculty and our staff is that your goal is after our students leave our building is that they don't need you anymore. They don't need you to edit essays for them because you have taught them how to write a good essay. They don't need you how to fill, uh, to tell them how to fill out a FAFSA form because you have taught them how to do it. They're only checking in and giving us updates. And yes, maybe, you know, some mentorship and guidance, like you always need that in your life, but it's not that power dynamic that the communities we are serving are relying so heavily on us. Our goal is to eliminate our jobs and eliminate ourselves if we're doing it correctly. So it's about building a sense of uh, an actual independent agency. Um, Yes, and self-worth. You don't have a lot of self-worth if everything you do is relying on others' charity. It's it's not a healthy dynamic. And ironically enough, it was like uh, progressives and liberals that were doing the the handout piece and the conservative Southern Baptist that was like, nope, you're working. So you also talk about the decision that you made to give up your Jordanian citizenship after coming to the U.S. Uh, and you yeah. said it was the hardest decision you've ever had to make. Um, yeah. And I was wondering why and how does this compare um, maybe to, to some of the decisions? Well, actually, decisions is the wrong word. Um, what some of the refugee children at okay. your school are going through. Yeah. Like being Jordanian is a big part of my identity. And it is a country that I deeply love. Um, But because of my sexual orientation, 
those things um, are not compatible, to say the least. You would get the death penalty in Jordan for being gay. Um, honor killings are prevalent uh, to this day. Um, and so, you know, it was a conscious decision to apply for asylum, but I really didn't have much of a choice. Like it was either apply for asylum and get it and live in the United States or go back to Jordan and face um, whatever consequences there would be for me there. Um, and so it was like um, very mixed feelings when I actually received the paper and saying that my asylum application had been approved because it felt like a part of me was completely gone. Like my Jordanian part was gone um, at that moment. Like mm -hmm. it will never be gone. It's a big part of who I am. Um, and then trying to figure out what's next, like, who am I now? Um, I didn't have my family. They disowned me. Um, and that was also a big part of who I was. Like family's a big, uh, plays a big role in, in our communities and to not have your parents or your siblings or your cousins. Um, it was tough. Um, and, and so I think part of, I mean, big part of why I do this work is it's not, selfless it's it's selfish in a way because it heals me to work with others who have gone through what i've gone through on some level um i have a hard time saying it's exactly the same um mm -hmm. because i have a lot of privileges and opportunities um i saw war from a distance you know in iraq and lebanon um and you know but i i did not see it firsthand um and, and I had financial means to hire a lawyer. I had an education here, so my integration into the United States was a lot easier. Um, but the feeling of not having a home and not belonging and not uh, being able to go back to the country that you love, um, that is something I can relate to on a deeply personal level. And I know you talked about uh, the importance that soccer played in sort of building that identity within – um, yeah. within the children at Fuji's Academy. What other ways do you go about building that identity outside of soccer? I know you talked about the classroom size being uh -huh. 14, just like a mm -hmm. soccer team would be. Um, yeah. I didn't know if there was anything that was in the curriculum that might work towards that. So we, some design. of it is curriculum. So we, we do ha house system. So all the students are in houses, which are multi-age. So you have older students mentoring younger students. They hold them accountable for their grades and their performance and their behavior. So it's a lot of it is that peer accountability in our curriculum. Like, let's say in our sixth grade class, if we're doing uh, Little Red Riding Hood, we're doing Leila and, the, uh, Leila and the Wolf, which is the Middle Eastern version. And then there's a South Korean version. Um, we do um, in high school a lot more uh, immigrant and refugee authors. And then we do more of the traditional texts. Um, we have international potlucks every month um, where students bring food from their countries and celebrate it and explain it and have to identify the ingredients in it. So they're always having that connection home and being proud of it. It, it feels like if you come into the building, it doesn't feel like a school. It feels like a family. Like everybody's got each other's back and part of it is through the soccer, part of it's through the small classrooms. Our students all read their report cards in front of each other. Um, and it's because if someone in our community is struggling, we are all responsible. So if one of our students is failing, we are all responsible in helping them pass. Mm -hmm. Whether it's making sure they show up to school and getting them out of bed and, and having them show up on time, whether it's uh, sitting next to them at tutoring and making sure their homework is complete or whether it's just telling them, Hey, I believe in you. We've got this, or I need you because we need you to play this weekend. And it's just like a, a beautiful way for kids to show that they support each other. And that if you're failing, it's okay. Cause we all have your back. You also talk about, uh, not to keep bringing up your Ted talk, but uh, you talk about the label refugee having connotations of being something that's dirty, something mm -hmm. to be ashamed of. Do you think there's any way to change those connotations surrounding the label? And if so, how? I think we, we need to humanize the refugee experience and we need to take control of the narrative. Um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, organizations switch from using refugees to using migrants 
And I'm like, why are you doing that? Like, why are you rejecting that word instead of saying, nope, this is the face, this is the story, this is who we are. And I think we need to be more vocal. I think our stories need to get out there. I think the bulk of uh, Americans have the refugee story in their family history. And I would love for, for like there to be some kind of campaign where you are tracing like your grandparents or your great grandparents journey to the United States and what that looked like, where we can find some commonality in, in what my, my students and myself went through. Um, and I think it's just taking ownership. It's, it's not being ashamed of that word. It's like, this is something that is strong, that is powerful, and just reframing it and re rebranding it in a way, um, and not letting others define who you are. Another another thing you say, uh, you know, when you find yourself choosing between home and survival, the question "Where are you from?" becomes very loaded. Um, mm -hmm. could you just explain that further and uh, what you meant by that. So, um, so I'll, I'll use my experience because I don't want to speak for any of my students. But like, I, I get at where are you from, um, and I don't know how to answer that because I don't know if I should say I'm from Jordan. Um, which was where I was born and I considered for a long time my home, but is no longer my home because I had to leave it to survive. Or am I from Georgia because I lived there for 15 years? Or am I from Columbus because that's where I'm living right now? It's, it's very loaded. And our students also don't know how to answer it. Like we'll have someone say, you know, where are you from? And uh, like some of our Burmese students will say Thailand because that's where they were born. And they have very negative associations with Burma and with the government. And so they don't want to identify as Burmese. And so we have to work to see what they feel comfortable with. And it evolves um, from saying they're Thai to then realizing that the Thai government didn't actually treat them with respect to identifying as American, but it's like, what hyphen do you use? Like, do you use your ethnic group? Do you use your tribe? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it gets really complicated and it brings up a lot of, I think, intense emotions on, on what that means. It's like, why can't I say I'm Jordanian? Because part of me does not want to accept the country that has rejected me. But that's part of a big part of who I am. And I think you made a really good point there that, um, at least indirectly, that this is something that rejection from the place that you call home is something that a lot of Americans don't have to face or, and will They'll never, never have, have to face. To face yeah. it. They will never have to. And, and that's, that's like incredibly lucky because I think part of what, why there's this like misunderstanding and, um, demonizing refugees is because that experience is so far removed from the average American. Because when when will we ever have to flee this great country? Like, it's the safest country in the world. But, like, for me growing up in Jordan, it was, like, every year we're like, when is when are we going to get attacked? When is the Scud missile going to drop into the middle of Amman instead of, like, somewhere on where we border? Like, war was just, like, a factor all the time. And figuring out how we would flee was was always there. It was like, this is how we would run. This is how we would get out. Um, and and here that, like, like my children will never have to grow up with that. Mm -hmm. And they're very lucky mm -hmm. to not have to grow up with that. Last question. So if people want to uh, learn more about Fuji's family, Fuji's Academy, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and wish to contribute, whether that be financial, volunteer, what should they do? Um, they should go to our website, fujisfamily.org, and we have ways for people to donate, to volunteer, um, ways to contact us. Uh, you know, we we would never have made it this far without, like, the thousands of people who have contributed uh, $10, $15 a month to get us to where we are now. And, like, for us, we, we like to share stories of who is supporting our our schools with our students because it's really important for them to know that there are people out there who believe in them mm -hmm. and are committed to this cause because there's so many, so much uh, information and so much like crap out there that tells them the opposite. Um, so I'd encourage people to get involved as much as they can. 
And uh, just before we end here, is there anything that you would like to say to our listeners or anything you would like to end on in particular, any message? You know, I, I always say like when you don't understand someone, you don't understand an ex- experience or something feels so different to you, instead of taking a step back, like take a step forward and try to understand, try to walk in that person's shoes to see where they're coming from. I, I do that all the time, like whether it's it's with my students or someone who politically disagrees with me, instead of like taking a step back and getting defensive and just shutting down is like, why can't we take a step toward each other and try to communicate and talk to each other and maybe we'll find some commonality. And if we don't, that's okay, but I really believe we can find a lot of commonality in our experiences and in our values. Thank you so much for uh, your time today, Luma, and I really appreciate it. And I know our listeners will really appreciate what you've contributed to the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Seeking Refuge. If you want to get in contact with us, you can email us at seekingrefugepodcast at gmail.com or follow us at Refuge Podcast on Twitter. Thank you to Luma for taking the time to talk with us today. For more information on Fuji's family, you can check out the link in the description of this episode. Also, huge thanks to Maxi International House for making this show possible. Our next episode will be out in two weeks. We'll see you then.